The next item of business is debate on motion 16171 in the name of Christina McKelvey. Yes. Okay, thank you. On International Women's Day 2019, Balance for Better. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Shirley Ann Somerville to speak to and move the motion for up to 12 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to open this year's International Women's Day debate. Firstly, I'd like to thank Gillian Martin, who had planned to hold a members' business debate on International Women's Day, but has kindly agreed to participate in the government's debate instead, and I look forward to hearing her contribution. International Women's Day is a day to celebrate women's social, economic and cultural contributions to society and to raise awareness of the structural inequalities, discrimination and violence experienced by women in girls in Scotland and around the world. A day to reaffirm our commitment to women's rights and to galvanise our collective efforts to ending gender inequality. When I was considering the theme for this year's international women's debate, Balance for Better, it struck me that here in these stark global statistics is a reflection of the ongoing inequality that women face. Women constitute just under half of the world's population, perform nearly two-thirds of its work and receive one-tenth of the world's income. Research from organisations working internationally also reveal that 75% of the world's illiterate people are women, only 24% of parliamentary seats worldwide are held by women, and violence against women causes more deaths and disability among women 15 to 44 than cancer, malaria, traffic accidents or war. Add women's responsibility for caring and community cohesion and the picture is clear. Women's contribution is immense, but not reflected in status, reward or position in society. Women are a long way short of equality and the need to pursue this agenda is as important as ever. And this is no less so here in Scotland, where one in five women experience domestic abuse from a male partner in their lifetime. Women earn overall 15.6% less than men. Women occupy the lowest paid jobs in the lowest paid occupations, are underrepresented in boardrooms and decision making bodies and discriminate against in employment and access to services. So I'm very clear we do not have gender equality and we are still far away from achieving balance. This is not an issue past its sell-by date. It is no less important than any other equality issues and it demands the attention of all of us. We inherit the legacy of centuries of discrimination, ingrained sexism and patriarchy and we should not underestimate, underestimate the difficulty in overcoming this. However, it would be pessimistic and a great disrespect to the thousands of women in Scotland and worldwide who have fought, struggled and dedicated their lives to achieving equality for women, not to recognise the tremendous steps taken and the progress made. It is fitting to acknowledge today the work of the women's sector in Scotland, who hold us to account and push government to break down the systemic inequality that women and girls face. Organisations such as Engender, Rape Crisis Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid, Close the Gap, the Scottish Women's Convention and Equate Scotland provide us with a gendered analysis of women's experience and challenge us to go further to achieve the position in society that they deserve. One of the ways in which we can challenge the myths and raise the awareness is to remember, to record and to celebrate the contribution and progress of women. Virginia Woolf once said, for most of history, Anonymous was a woman. We can't achieve equality for women without identifying and eradicating the discrimination and disadvantage that they face. That's why the First Minister established her National Advisory Council on Women and Girls. The First Minister's ambition was for the Council that it would act as a catalyst for change to address gender inequality by providing independent strategic advice to the First Minister. The Advisory Council's vision is of a Scotland which is recognised as a world leader for its commitment and action towards realising an equal society where all women and girls can reach their true potential. Certainly. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I wonder if the Minister would also recognise, as given in an answer by the Health Secretary at, at General Questions today, that this month the advisory group are taking, um, <coughs> are, are taking contributions on women's health inequalities, which I think is something that's featured over the past few weeks in Parliament very highly. 
Shirlene Somerville. Uh, well, uh, Elaine Smith is quite right to, to point uh, to that, and uh, I, indeed I was in the chamber for, for the Cabinet Secretary's answer on that, and it is a very important um, aspect that we, we must um, make sure gives, is given sufficient attention by the government, but uh, as society as a whole, so I would thoroughly um, endorse her remarks on that issue. So the Advisory Council um, published its inaugural 2018 end of year report on the 25th of January, setting out 11 recommendations to realise gender equality in areas from justice to women's political representation, childcare and education. The Council's recommendations are ambitious and thought-provoking, intended to drive systemic change. They reflect the First Minister's ask of the Council to be bold, even to make the government feel a little bit uncomfortable. And we are actively considering the recommendations of the Advisory Council, and I'm pleased to announce that it will be my portfolio's responsibility to ensure that the recommendations are given the priority that they deserve. Over the course of last year, women's political representation has been high on the agenda. 2018 was, of course, the centenary of women's suffrage and women's right to stand for election to Parliament, and a range of events and activity to celebrate the centenary were held across the UK. In Scotland, a small grant scheme supported 50 projects across the country. I'm also pleased that the Scottish Government is supporting YWC Scotland and the Young Women's Movement and the Parliament Project to deliver the Scot Scott Women Stand campaign, which encourages women to consider standing for election and uses a range of online tools and resources to provide practical support and advice. Now, Presiding Officer, I don't have time to do justice to all the work that's been taken forward, but I would like to highlight some today. In my own portfolio, the Scottish Government has committed in its Social Security Charter that policy development will advance equality, non-discrimination and human rights in line with the principles enshrined in the Social Security Scotland Act 2018. Women are twice as dependent on Social Security as men and have less access to resources, assets and occupational pensions. This is due to a number of factors, including women being more likely to give up work to care, earning less than men and challenges in accessing childcare. This situation is ev made even more acute in households where women experience domestic abuse. Research assessing the UK government's social security reform highlights the disproportionate negative impact of this reform on women. And this has resulted in women being placed at a greater risk of deeper and sustained poverty. The driver for the reform has been austerity and it has not taken a gender equality into account. The design of a social security system can have an impact on the gender pay gap in a number of ways. It can equalise access to income or it can exacerbate inequalities. It can act as an enabler for women to access retraining or fully and equally participate in the labour market. It can force women in taking jobs which are detrimental to their well-being and long-term earning potential. In response, we outlined in our Fairer Scotland Action Plan, Child Poverty Action Plan and Equally Safe Delivery Plan how we will seek to mitigate the UK Government's social security reform founded on the basis of dignity, respect and human rights and to make the system fairer where we can. However, we recognise that we must continue to look at how we can ensure that gender equality is taken into account within our own social security system. And in relation to women in the workplace, the Scottish Government has been working with our key partners to develop our ambitious gender pay gap uh, action plan, which will be published shortly. Presiding officer, our work to eradicate violence against women and girls continues to be a priority for us. We are clear it is a fundamental violation of human rights. It cannot and must not be allowed to stand. The Scottish Government recognises that we must challenge it, prevent it and support survivors. In order to help us work towards this goal, we are implementing Equally Safe, Scotland's strategy to prevent and eradicate violence against women and girls. We are also investing significant levels of funding, bringing forward new legislation and working to strengthen frontline services. However, we recognise that we must also have a strong and decisive focus on building a society where this violence does not occur in the first place. For that to happen, we must all acknowledge and work to address that the root cause of violence against women and girls is women's inequality. That is why Equally Safe prioritises primary prevention and focuses on pro progressing women's equality, changing attitudes and behaviours, building knowledge and skills of individuals and ultimately delivering a progressive shift in the structural, cultural and societal context in which this violence occurs. 
This strategy provides an overarching framework to deliver this change, but we recognise that we must also take forward specific actions to realise our ambitions, and that is why in November 2017 we published our Equally Safe Delivery Plan. In conclusion, I've only had time to touch on some of the work we are undertaking with our partners, but I hope my remarks make clear the government's commitment to tackling women's inequality in a systemic way. Now, as everyone here knows, this year marks the 20 years since devolution. And as we celebrate International Women's Day, I think it is fitting that we look back on the gains that have been made since devolution. Irrespective of our political persuasion, we can all, I hope, agree that devolution has allowed us to raise the profile of women's equality in Scotland. From that first parliamentary debate, which focused on domestic abuse, to the annual takeover of the debating chamber by over 300 women to mark International Women's Day, it has allowed us to use the powers we have to make real change for women and girls, such as legislation like the Domestic Abuse and the Gender Representation on Public Boards Act. Another aim I hope we can all agree on is that we want to make sure that all women, regardless of not only their ethnic background, religion or belief, their sexual orientation, disability or age, access the best possible opportunities, can make a full contribution to our society and economy and improve their own lives. So let's celebrate our achievements and make a further commitment to do all we can to achieve gender equality and balance for better. Thank you. Could you move the motion, please? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And I call Annie Wells for up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I feel honoured to be opening for the Scottish Conservatives in today's debate marking International Women's Day. And I also want to thank all the organisations that sent through briefings um, ahead of today's debate. While celebrating the achievements of women and girls throughout history, I want this year to be a year in which we see, a, see real change. Too often I feel like I stand up in the chamber knowing the challenges ahead and feeling disheartened about the pace in which progress is being made. Society has a big role to play, which is something I will stress today, as does, of course, government. Although this year's theme focuses largely on the workforce and economy, there is so much to say on general societal attitudes, education, sport, the media, and not to forget politics. Today, we will be supporting the Scottish Government's motion in the spirit of the global event and reaffirming our support to upholding and protecting the rights of women and girls. The concept of a Women's Day has been around since 1909. Following a march held in New York that year, it was suggested at the International Women's Conference in 1910 that March the 8th, which is tomorrow, became an official event. And since 1996, the UN has selected a campaign theme to be launched on the day and continued the all year round. And this year's theme, as we've heard, is Balance for Better, brings renewed focus to achieving equality and representation and the workforce. And it reminds us there's still a long way to go and why a gender balance is essential to economies and communities to thrive. Importantly, it is also time to celebrate the achievements of women both now and throughout history. In my time as an MSP, I have met many women who have inspired me with their achievements. Recently, I met a local activist from Glasgow, Cara Tevin, a student from Strathclyde University, who worked tirelessly on a campaign to get pubs and clubs to offer lids on drinks so to deter drink spikers. Cara, using her own initiative to protect women and girls against this awful crime, now has the backing of Police Scotland as she looks to roll out the campaign nationwide. I also met Dee Bradbury, who last year became the first female president of a Tier 1 nation a top job in Scottish rugby. And last year, I also had the privilege to meet Donna Kennedy, who is the most capped rugby player, male or female, and is now rightly in Scotland's Rugby Hall of Fame. And I was delighted to be there and present when it happened. And I've also had the opportunity to reflect on the changes that I've seen in my lifetime, from my time at school, where the only options offered to me were either administrative or secretarial, to my niece now studying sports science at the University of Stirling. And in fact, when I looked into it, women are now far more likely to start a university course than men, with six in 10 first year Scottish students being women. So indeed, uh, progress. It is right that we reflect on these changes, as well as the subtler ones not necessarily linked to government policy, but wider society. 
In recent months, as, as examples, we've seen the release and success of major fil films with all female leads and where the main plotline isn't romance. We saw the announcement last year that women can now apply for the Royal Marines and all other frontline military roles. And we've also seen the continuation of the Me Too and Time's Up movements. To some, these changes may seem insignificant, but to me, they are signs that society is beginning to re really question traditional attitudes towards women and girls in everyday life. And I think it's great the status quo is being challenged and that as society, we're becoming more aware of what it means to achieve true gender equality. Today's debate does, however, also shine a light on where change really is still needed. And whilst I use examples of university places to highlight progress, it does still remain the case that some individual subjects are dominated by either women or men. In the UK, the percentage of women studying a STEM degree makes up just 24% of the total and 15% of engineering graduates were women in 2017, compared with 30% in India. More concerning still is that the proportion of young women studying engineering and physics has remained virtually static since 2012. And in some subject areas, such as computing degree programmes, the numbers are falling. Earlier in the week, I was lucky enough to visit Walker Precision Engineering as part of the Scottish Apprenticeship Week. And whilst I was blown away by the positive impact the apprenticeships were having on the young people's lives, I was disappointed not to meet a female apprentice. And when I asked why this was the case, the company stated that simply women were not applying. So it's clear more needs to be done to change traditional views in what women and men should do educationally and in their careers. Yes. Ruth McGuire. Just so while you're, uh, Annie Wells is talking about um, STEM and apprenticeships there, in my area, Ayrshire College ran a campaign, this Ayrshire Girl Can, um, which encouraged young women and girls to go into STEM subjects. Is that the sort of thing you think would be helpful? Annie Wells. Absolutely, and I look forward to hearing more from, from the member on that. It is things like that we really need to see um, rolled out across the country. And, and on that point, I would like to ask the Minister what action has been taken to overcome the barrier. And more broadly speaking, it is incumbent on all of us to have these discussions day to day. All of this, of course, feeds into the types of jobs women do. Women still largely represent those in low-skilled, low-paid jobs in Scotland. And women earn, on average, 14% less than men, a figure which rises to 30% for part-time workers. In business, although there are examples of good practice, as I've said with companies like FDM in Glasgow, systemic change is still needed. As will be said time and time again, childcare is imperative to this. Women are still faced with the overwhelm overwhelming societal expectation that they should lead on childcare, and we must encourage companies to incorporate organisational designs that recognise the pressures women face. In politics, of course, I, I just want to make some progress here. I'm, in politics, we've of course seen progress from last year marking the centenary of some women being given the right to vote. And in 2017, a record number of female MPs being elected to the House of Commons. However, I know as well as anyone, the need for vast improvement. In the Scottish Parliament, just 35% of MSPs elected in 2016 were women. And in my own party, the percentage is even lower. I'm just about to get into my last minute, I've got a, a wee bit to do. I acknowledge this, which is why I set up Women to Win, with colleagues to ensure that continuous work is being done to get more women involved. The organisation is working hard to identify, recruit, assess, support and mentor female candidates, and the results of which we won't be able to see until the next election. Presiding officer, I'd like to finish by expressing my gratitude to the women and girls who have devoted their lives to upholding and protecting our rights. I wholeheartedly support the sentiments of International Women's Day, a debate I've been privileged enough to speak in each year. And I hope that by continuing to shine a light on this issue, we can inspire women and men to achieve the change still desperately needed. And one thing lastly, I couldn't let this debate go by without mentioning my mum, Maria, who continues to inspire me every day. Thank you. I call on Rhoda Grant for seven minutes, please. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, we celebrate International Women's Day at the weekend, and I'm pleased to speak in support of the government motion today. This year's theme is Balance for Better, which is about ensuring gender balance in all, all areas, equal representation at every level, equal pay in every occupation, and I'm especially proud that the Scottish Labour Party has taken positive action to back our commitment to 50-50 representation. We've achieved this a number of times in the Scottish Parliament. However, if we've learned any lessons, it is that it does need positive action and any achievement can't be taken for granted. If we let down our guard, it slips back. Unfortunately, in other areas such as councils and the UK Parliament, we still struggle and have yet to achieve 50-50. But I would ask other parties to join with us and take positive action to increase women's representation in this Parliament and indeed at every level of government. People argue that the representatives should be selected and elected on merit alone. And I agree. I so look forward to the day that happens a day when women will be elected on their merit, because it doesn't happen today. If you're a man, you are so much more likely to be selected and elected, not because you have greater merit than a woman does, but simply because you're a man. Until women can compete on merit alone, we need to take steps to deal with the gender discrimination that favours men. We all know people who argue that merit works now, and what they're actually saying is that women are of less merit than men are. And these people discriminate against women, they're sexist, and they need to address that behaviour. We have seen men favoured throughout society. We have seen this in politics, we've seen it on boards, we've seen it uh, both on, uh, in public and private boards and in our legal systems, and we must act to stop it. The Scottish Government appoint public boards and they must ensure that women's voices are heard there, but more importantly on the appointment boards, because like recruits like, so we need to have women in those positions where they will also recruit women. And while all women face an uphill struggle, women from ethnic minority groups face, an even, great, face even greater discrimination, not only gender discrimination, but also race discrimination. And therefore, I have to pay tribute to the work of Talat Yaqub, a founder member of Women 5050, who has worked both personally and professionally for the cause of women. And she's an inspiration for all women, measured but absolutely uncompromising. Presiding officer, equality is not an end in, its, in itself, it's simply not a numbers game. We all lose out if we don't hear women's voices. We've all seen the difference that women make when they're empowered. Their knowledge and personal experience adds to the debate. Decisions are made on a broader base with a diversity of views, and this is why we must strive to have councils, parliaments and boards and the like reflect society with regard to gender, ethnicity, disability and sexuality. Gillian Martin. I, I note that um, uh, Rhoda Grant talks about public boards. Would she agree with me that there's an awful lot more to be done in the private sector as well? And there's actually great potential on having 50-50 representation for the private sector. Rhoda Grant. I, I would absolutely agree with that. And not just because, again, because of the numbers game, but because that diversity leads better, to better de decision making. And it reflects the views of all the people that are represented in society. And for instance, would we have laws, the laws we have now around violence against women without women in this parliament? And would we have a campaign against period poverty without women in this parliament? I think not. Equality doesn't stop with representation, it must go further. Equal pay has been law for decades and yet we see, even in public organisations, that we have not achieved it. It's not just pay for the job, but it's also promoted posts in workplaces where women dominate. If you take, for example, primary school teaching or nursing, dominated by women, but the promoted posts are still dominated by men. Why is that? Is it because women are being forced to choose between family and career? Is it because as a society, we expect women to take on the caring roles? In Scandinavian countries, maternity leave is shared. Both parents can take career breaks to look after children. Therefore, to get equality, we need to have equality at home as well as at work. Governments are also contributing to inequality 
austerity has had a disproportionate impact on women. Women make up the majority of single parent households and they have been particularly badly hit. Philip Alston, Alston, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, said that the UK welfare system is so sexist it could have been compiled by a group of misogynists in a room. What an indictment. Is sexism so entrenched in our society that even our welfare system reflects this? That's why we in the Scottish Labour Party have targeted poverty. Our budget asks were to increase child support and remove the two-child cap. These were focused policies that we sought to mitigate some of the negative aspects of our welfare policy that targeted women. Sadly, violence against women continues to increase. Domestic abuse continues to grow, even given the actions of this parliament since its inception, where we would have hoped to see a decline. Back in the first parliament, my colleague Maureen Macmillan piloted the first committee bill through the parliament, providing protection against domestic abuse. Since then, every government and every parliament has continued in this vein. Yet it appears we've had little impact on the overall situation. We need to teach boys respect. We need to stop their access to violent pornography that forms their sex education and warps their understanding of relationships. It's for all of us, not just parents, to do this. We need to look at how we regulate online pornography. The digital platforms have had long enough to put their house in order, and they must now be forced to take action to protect future generations. And we must also protect children from abusive parents. No parent has a right to access their children. When a parent abuses their partner, they also abuse their child. And this must mean that they lose access to those children. Too often it doesn't happen, and access is used to perpetrate continued abuse. It needs to stop. We all know that a child's life chances, health, wealth, and education are directly linked to those of their mother. We cannot tackle child poverty without tackling their mother's poverty. We cannot build a child's self-esteem while leaving them subject to domestic abuse. On International Women's Day, we need to redouble our efforts to tackle these issues and to create a truly equal society for our children to inherit. I call on Andy Whiteman for four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and it gives me pleasure to rise to speak on behalf of the Scottish Green Party in this International Women's Day uh, debate. In fact, in preparation for this, I was reading Rhoda Grant's contribution from last year in which she said that I wish my role as, as woman and equality spokes person did not need to exist. I wish that International Women's Day did not need uh, to exist. And I agree, because although the day is a global day celebrating women, it is also a call for action to fight against patriarchy and deliver genuine equality. And as such, its continuing need is disappointing to say uh, the least. Uh, like others, I thank those who've provided briefings uh, for today's uh, debate, reminding us, as indeed the minister did, uh, of the issues around care, the media, health, representation, and violence that still require serious action to overcome inequality. I'd also like to commend uh, Engender for its recent shadow report uh, on measures necessary to give effect to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, uh, a UN treaty adopted 40 years ago, in fact, this year, in December 1979, in which defined discrimination in Article 1 as any distinction, exclusion or restriction made on the basis of sex, which is the effect or purpose of impairing or nullifying the recognition, enjoyment or exercise by women, irrespective of their marital status, on a basis of equality of men and women, of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the political, economic, social, cultural, civil or any other field. The recommendations made in that shadow report across the 15 substantive articles uh, of the treaty, uh, observance of which is a devolved matter, are worthy of close attention, and I hope the Scottish Government will respond to them in due course, and I might, we might hear something of that in closing. But as Angela Constance observed in opening the debate on International Women's Day in 2017, she said that it is a stark fact that in 2017, women nowhere in the world can claim to have the same rights and opportunities as men. No country has eradicated violence against women and girls, eliminated pay inequality, or erased discrimination and prejudice. Now, we know, of course, that International Women's Day had its origins in New York, uh, in Denmark, and in pre-revolutionary Russia, and was a product of socialist organizing. 
significantly it was on the 8th of March 1917, 1917 uh, that women celebrating International Women's Day joined those protesting against food rationing, leading to riots against, across Petrograd, and women organising and recruiting over 50,000 workers to strike against the food shortages, against the Tsar, and against the end of World War, or, or and for the end of World War I. 100 years later, women and girls remain the world's most numerous and discriminated against human beings. For example, in 20, 2006, I moved to Ethiopia. During a long walk through the Simeon Mountains in northern Ethiopia, we rested for a moment on top of a high escarpment overlooking a green valley. Even at some distance, we could hear shouting and screaming. We took a close look through binoculars and observed a young girl running with men chasing her. They caught her and beat her with sticks before dragging her back towards the village from which she was running. She was one of tens of millions of girls in Ethiopia, 40% of women aged 20 to 24, who have been forced into so-called marriage before the legal age of 18. And running away, of course, affords the slim chance of a better life, but is fraught with danger, with many young girls ending up in the streets of Addis Ababa, begging or forced into prostitution. In India, too, there is a long history of endemic discrimination uh, and violence, and being conceived as a girl, as Vicky Allen wrote in an award-winning article in the Sunday Herald in 2015, is to put you at risk of feticide, infanticide, neglect, abandonment, bride burning, wife torturing, dowry killing, and domestic violence. In short, in many parts of that country, girls are not wanted. Presiding officer, the struggle for true equality between the sexes is the biggest ongoing social struggle facing all of us. Women bravely across the world have been leading the campaign to eradicate the patriarchy, but we men too have a special responsibility to see, listen, learn, and act about the systematic and structural ways in which women and girls face discrimination on a level never experienced by men. Thank you. I call Alex Cole Hamilton for four minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It is the third occasion I've had the honour to speak for my party um, on, inter on the occasion of International Women's Day. I have to say that in previous occasions I have risen with some embarrassment, obviously uh, representing the views of five blokes in a parliament that should reflect the society we all seek to serve is an embarrassing situation. But since I came to this place, we have, as a party, made strides in remedying that, both in the fact that uh, we ha now have a front bench spokesperson's team, which is entirely 50-50. We have, uh, in the snap general election, returned a parliamentary team to Westminster, which is made up of two men and two women. And on the poll this afternoon, which would put us on, on 10 MSPs, in terms of the internal party structures we have in place, we would see five of those seats uh, given to women. Uh, so I am grateful that we are making progress, but we're still a ways to go. Uh, in September last year, a man attended a job interview. Uh, it was surprisingly acrimonious for a job interview and at one point through a veil of tears he actually shouted at the panel I like beer I still like beer that astonishing admission was in part an attempt to answer allegations that that same job interview panel had heard the day before a day later he then attempted to justify that outburst by saying sometimes I get emotional perhaps too emotional but he still got the job of course, the candidate I'm referring to is Brett Kavanagh. The panel that he was up in front of was the Senate Judiciary Committee, and the job was, of course, Supreme Court Justice of the United States of America. Presiding officer, the highest law officers on the planet, like the highest politicians on the planet, must reflect the better natures of the society that they seek to serve. Yet Brett Kavanagh had been accused in dignified detail by Christine Blasey Ford of assault and harassment. But he had become notorious in far earlier in his career and gained attention and notoriety for traducing the reputation of Monica Lewinsky in the late 90s in an attempt to bring down the presidency of Bill Clinton. Now, I defy anyone to state with certainty in this place that would any of those qualities or behaviours exhibited by Brett Kavanaugh in that protest exhibited by a woman, would she have still got that job? And the fact is we still, as a global society, treat women demonstrably differently than men, whether that's in pay, whether that's in the pink tax, which my friend and colleague Christine Jardin 
has launched a campaign on this week about simple domestic uh, sanitary, uh, san um, sanitary products for men which are cheaper than women. Um, the representation in public art, the sexual harassment in terms of the fact that we still have a benefit structure de delivered by the DWP which pays single, ho single claimants to uh, households, sometimes uh, compounding domestic abuse. And indeed, in the provision of childcare, we still have an expectation that that will fall to the women. My party, I'm proud to say, in its time in government in Westminster, did something to address that. And that was with the introduction of shared parental leave, which will mean, I hope, that for the very first time, that young people going for a job interview will not be prejudiced on their childbearing age, that a woman will be no less likely to ask to take leave than her uh, male partner. And I'm very proud of that. Now, Caressa Scott King said that the struggle for equality is never truly won. You have to win it with every generation. And we see in the appointment of Brett Kavanaugh and in the increasingly misogynist language in some of the political quarters of this world where that struggle for our generation still lies. I started uh, my remarks today with a quote from a Supreme Court justice uh, presiding officer, and I will finish one as well. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I'm sure, carries the support of all of these benches, and we hope that she continues in her role for many years to come. But she, was, uh, she said, and I think this sums things up perfectly, when I am asked where, when, there will be a time, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court, I say, when there are nine of them. People are shocked, but there have already been nine men, and nobody's ever raised a question about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Moving to the open debate, I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Ms Thank Martin, you, please. Uh, this year's International Women's Day message is balance for better. Why is balance better? And I'd, I'd like to concentrate on why gender balance in women's eco economy is good, uh, equality is good for the economy. Gender bias, conscious or unconscious, of course hurts women's life chances. But more than that, it hurts Scottish finances. I convened the cross-party group on women in enterprise, and no matter what theme we're discussing in our meetings, the same barriers come up that stop women playing their full role in our economy as business owners. They are always these. Assumptions that women are the main carer in the household. Lack of flexible or agile working opportunities. Male-centric business support and unconscious buyers from the gatekeepers to support and finance and implied lack of legitimacy if there's not a man in the scene, either as a financial backer or a company partner, and this was mentioned again yesterday by uh, Fiona Matu Ma Maturo, who is the director of Radiant and Brighter, who I believe is in the gallery just now, along with Women's Enterprise Scotland ambassadors. The rise of women is not about the fall of men, it is about equality. And if equality for its own sake doesn't do it for you, then let me put it this way. Not having gender balance across every sector and a gender pay gap in our economy is wasteful and a dilution of our country's economic potential, of our global potential. The key study on this, with facts from around the economic arguments for balance and closing the gender pay gap, is the McKinsey Report, The Power of Parity, How Women's Equality Adds $12 trillion to Global Growth. McKinsey pointed to globally operating companies who had really targeted making their teams more diverse and tracked the positive effects of that on their profitability and productivity, and the results speak for themselves. And one of the mo things I'm most proud of to be involved in in this parliament is the work the Economy Committee did on the gender pay gap. Our report, No Small Change, the economic potential of closing the gender pay gap, drilled down on the causes of the lack of gender balance in Scottish workplaces, the economic cost of leaving things as they are, and the benefit, benefits of closing the gap. So we know that closing the gender pay gap could add 17 billion to Scotland's economy. And we also know that if the same amount of women set up in business as men do in Scotland and had the tailored support to help them sustain their businesses, we could be looking at a 6.7 billion influx into that economy too, according to Women's Enterprise Scotland. But of course, a lot has to happen for those economic bonanzas to be realised. And key amongst that is government-funded and flexible, high-quality childcare. The Scottish Government is making huge inroads into tackling this particular cause of women's enforced and structural economic in inactivity with the doubling of child free childcare. Presiding Officer, 
A country with a stubborn gender pay gap and a lack of gender balance in all sectors is a country that is not fulfilling its potential, and I would argue that's a country that is failing. And I'll end uh, by... Y yes, I will. It has to be brief. The member's in her last minute. Ms Harper. It'll be very brief. Um, does Julian Martin agree that one of the sectors is the agricultural sector and the Women in Ag Task Force and the local Dumfries and Galway Women in Dairy Network is helping promote advancing women to have a fairer Scotland? Thank you. Y y yes, I would. And I'd actually like to thank Emma Harper for coming along to a Women in Enterprise cross-party group where we talked about women in agriculture and her continued support for the work that we do there. I'm, I'm just going to f finish uh, briefly with one of my favourite stories, I think, which That's illustrates uh, sensible policy decisions around equality and how they're good for the economy. The former Norwegian Prime Minister Jens Stoltenberg was interviewed by the Washington Post in 2011. And the interviewer asked him what the secret of Norway's economic success was. And the journalist, I, I imagine, was expecting a reply, a reply about oil and gas. But Stoltenberg simply replied that it was Norway's women. He said, one Norwegian lesson is that if you can raise female participation, it helps the economy, birth rates and the budget. And of course, Norway funds all its childcare publicly and their tax take is the reward of that investment. So balance is better, not just for women's equality, but for everyone. Happy International Women's Day to you, presiding officer, and to everyone. I think that's the way to get extra time, Ms Martin. To congratulate me, wish me something, then you get extra time, it's a good bribe. You miss that in your applause. Don't everybody try it. I call Morris Corrie to be followed by Angela Constance. Mr Corrie, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you for that and advice. Um, I too am honoured to speak today in this International Women's Day debate. Um, I, it's also good to see some of us men stepping up to the mark in, in the debate itself. In 2019, it's not enough to simply acknowledge the good uh, which is being done to promote gender equality, but work actively to promote it. And I agree with the Scottish Women's Convention Chair, Agnes Tolmey, when she said, issues that, conf that confront women on a daily basis cannot be tackled unless policy and decision makers listen to and take action on women's views, experiences, and ideas. As these policy makers, we have the, respons as these policy makers, we have the, respons the responsibility to take action to ensure full gender equality. To strive for anything less would be to set our sights too low. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the founding of the Commonwealth Women's Parliamentari Parliamentarians, or CWP, a group founded by women delegates to increase female representation in parliaments. And their recent initiative to promote equality included appointing a male champion of change to ensure that the male parliamentarians also carry the torch for gender equality in Commonwealth parliaments and also legislators. I have, been pointed, I have been appointed as that CWP's male champion for this parliament, and while it is clear that the women, the women members in this parliament do not need a male to speak on their behalf, I am indeed humbled by this responsibility. I am determined to do what I can as a male MSP for gender balance in all aspects of this, uh, in this parliament. Yes, sure. Ruth McGuire. I thank Maurice Corrie for taking the intervention. I wonder if that would include speaking up for gender quotas to help um, increase female participation. Maurice yes, Corrie. Absolutely it would. And that has actually been talked about already at that level in the CWP. So thank you for that intervention. That's an important point. Um, Presiding officer, uh, the theme of this year's International Women's Day, Balance for Better, implies that achieving gender balance is not only morally right, but also makes sense. As, as easy as it is to simply say we are inclusive, some of us men must get out of our compass, comfort zones and also challenge our inherent biases. We need to support in word and deed those organizations which already are working hard at trying to eradicate gender e inequalities. And I commend the organizations such as Women to Win, of which my colleague Annie Wells, who started this, is a group dedicated to increasing the number of female conservative candidates on the ballot. And they have done it strikingly well, and their support has led, in part, to an increase in conservative female candidates running over the last 10 years. And I hope to see these numbers increase in the near future. Let us continue to shift our perspective and see what, that we are missing out on talent in the public sector and in the workplace when we don't strive for gender balance. And when there is parity in the councils of human decision-making in boardrooms and councils, better decisions are made. And including women's perspectives also benefits the national economy, as already been mentioned. And, they, and a landmark study in the 1970s asserted that overlooking gender, gender aspects of development projects led to project failure. 
From this time onwards, empirical research has confirmed linkage between gender variables and national economic performance. And research has found that improving women's equality affects security, GDP, and education on health outcomes. And the proportion of females in the workplace is also statistically significant in relation to the national economic growth, <clears throat> and as has been mentioned already. In light of such evidence, balance is truly better. Work, women's involvement positively shapes the economy, and the presence of women's voices directly affects economy, economic prosperity and the, the stability of the political system. Females' presence in economic decision-making can moderate overconfidence and risk. We need women's voices even more in this volatile world. Historically, the system has systematically excluded women from what we would define as a formal economy. And the traditional roles of women in caretaking render themselves invisible in the economic system. Yet, if this labor were to be calculated into the economy, even at minimum wage, it would account for some 40% of world production. And we have a responsibility as a government to recognize the women's invaluable contribution, both in and out of the formal economy, and we can do better here in Scotland. And Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, without women's voices and participation, we cannot hope to solve the most important problems of our day. Health problems, security of nations, economic stability cannot be addressed without the insight of half of our our population and we do and we must do everything in our power to include women in the conversation including stepping aside and simply listening thank, thank you thank you very much i now call angela constance to be followed by anna sarwar Ms. constance please thank you president officer uh, mary beard professor author broadcaster uh, in her women and power a manifesto shines a light on how many of our attitudes prejudices and strategies to silence women are wired into our culture. And she recounts the, the first recorded example of a man telling a woman to shut up as immortalized at the start of Homer's Odyssey when a young Telemachus, when challenged by his mother Penelope to change his tune, said to his mother, mother, go back upstairs into your quarters and take your own work, the loom and the distaff, Speech will be the business of men, and of me most of all, for mine is the power in this household. And 3,000 years later, sometimes it's hard not to conclude that our Western culture is well practiced at silencing women. Classical writers had much to say about the tone and timbre of women's voices and how tiresome is their barking, yapping, or whinging. Not such a distant culture, is it? And of course, Mary Beard, the, the Cambridge Dawn, has lost count of how many times she's been described as an ignorant moron. And I have to say, presiding officer, it was not until I had reached the grand age of 44 and had been appointed as the Cabinet Secretary for Education that I had the very first ever experience in my life of being called thick, or at least to my face. And I used to get lots of emails complaining about my glottal stop. Don't you know, the emails would say, there are two T's in Scottish, or as I would say, Scottish. <laughs> it is well known that Margaret Thatcher had voice training lessons to lower her voice, but I have to say that elocution lessons were never on my priority list. So women, eh, all women, eh, irrespective of the background, have the right to be heard. We are not some pale, stale, homogenous group. And in speaking up for all women, whether it's women with a disability, women from the BME community, lesbian women, bisexual women or trans women, I want to quote Caretta Scott King when she said, freedom and justice cannot be parceled out in pieces to suit political convenience. I don't believe you can stand for freedom for one group of people and deny it to others. And if I can just say... Uh, briefly, presiding officer, in terms of the debate uh, around gender recognition reform, can I appeal for tolerance, respect, patience from everyone without exception? Because we all know that you never persuade anyone of your position by noise uh, or by anger. And it is easy these days to become overwhelmed and uh, I suppose utterly frustrated that real equality between men and women is still an aspiration uh, for the future. However, uh, there is hope and there is progress. 
the establishment of this parliament 20 years ago increased the visibility of women in elected politics and achieved a consensus and focus on ending violence against women and girls. The legacy of the 2014 referendum, irrespective of what side you're on, led to the creation of a cross-party women's 50-50 campaign. And I do very much believe that our public services will be better for everyone as a result of balanced public sector boards. And in terms of hope for the future, it was utterly uplifting to get a text from my nine-year-old nephew, Robbie, this week, wanting to interview me for his homework on International Women's Day, asking who has inspired me. Well, of course, there are many people I would love to mention, but I just want to pay tribute to two very special women today. The first is a constituent of mine who, who recently passed away, Annie McKenzie, who was my local hero at the opening of the Parliament in 2011, due to her being a carer, a campaigner and a fundraiser for Huntington's disease. She was a larger-than-life character and will be sorely missed. And then, like Annie Wells, I want to pay tribute to my own mother, because my life is so different to that of my mother's. And the reason I have not had to endure the struggles that she has is in large part due to her. So, can I say to young Robbie, do not be like Telemachus and always listen to your mother. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Anna Sarwar to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Mr Sarwar, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I, I learned at a very young age that real men are feminists. And as a father of three boys, I hope I can bring up my sons to be feminists too. And I want to make just three points in, in the debate this afternoon. Firstly, is to pay tribute to all the inspiring women over the generations who have helped to effect and deliver change. Inspiring women who have made personal sacrifices through really difficult times to get change for the generations that follow. And change hasn't been easy. It hasn't come by accident. It has had blood, sweat and tears. So to all the women and all the sisters who have helped deliver the Equal Pay Act, the Sex Discrimination Act, the Equality Act, it recognised the challenges of violence to get women with the setting up of Scottish Women's Aid to those that drive campaigns today, for example, the 50-50 campaign for this parliament, for those that are speaking out and challenging around the Me Too movement and also us in this parliament in terms of the Gender Representation on Boards Act. Thank you to each and every single one of them. But there is still a whole lot more work to do. And that brings me to my second point. I think it's important to recognise that the fight against all forms of prejudice, including sexism and misogyny, can't be left to individual communities alone. We as men have to stand shoulder to shoulder with the sisters in this fight. We have to amplify their cause, but we also have to recognise that we too ourselves need to change. And I hope that every man will have reflected on their behaviour post the Me Too campaign. Because just as I say, that it's not just a fight for women against sexism. The exact same applies for all other forms of prejudice and hate. We can't just leave it to our ethnic minority communities to challenge racism. We can't just leave it to our Muslim communities to challenge Islamophobia. We can't just leave it to our Jewish communities to challenge anti-Semitism. We can't just leave it to the LGBT community to challenge homophobia. It has to be seen as a fight for every single one of us. And only if we see it genuinely as our own fight will we defeat prejudice and hate in all its forms. And that brings me to the, the third point, which is what I wanted to focus on, presiding officer, and that is to recognize the intersectionality of prejudice and hate. I've mentioned uh, homophobia, I've mentioned uh, racism, I've mentioned Islamophobia, I've mentioned anti-Semitism. You are twice as likely to be the victim of a racist attack or an Islamophobic attack or an anti-Semitic attack if you are a woman. That is not a coincidence. That is a deliberate targeting of women because people see women as an easier target. And that means circumstances that I've seen myself in terms of women having their headscarves, for example, pulled off their heads at train stations, people being sworn at or assaulted in our underground system. And I think there is a particular challenge around our public transport system and about how people are victimized around our public transport system. And therefore, my challenge again is how do we work alongside those women who are even more tight in that minority and uh, amplify their voice so we can allow Jewish, Muslim and ethnic minority women to come forward and speak about their own challenges and their own 
experiences. And I want to share with you just one practical example of that. A family shared a story with me about their daughter in a classroom. Their daughter in a classroom who just the week after the Paris attacks experienced horrific sexism and Islamophobia. Her, she, during her lunch hour, had pupils in the class coming up to her and opening their jackets and pretending they were suicide bombers in front of her face. When the teacher came in at the end of the lunch hour and saw this taking place, he didn't reprimand the pupils. He joined in and did it with his own jacket too. And when the parents went to that school to see how broken that girl was with the circumstances, the explanation they got back was it was the only way the teacher thought he could control the classroom and get it back to order. Now, presenting officer, you tell me how that child will ever have confidence that she can speak out on any form of prejudice or hate if that's what she can expect in her own classroom. And that's just one little example. And that's why I ask us all, please, to recognize that in a time of division where we see an us versus them politics rising across our country, across Europe, and across the world, we have to redouble our efforts to fight for equality in all its forms. And that's why I stand in solidarity with the sisterhood today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to be quite firm with members from now on because I have no time in hand. So Ruth McGuire, call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Alison Harris. It has to be four minutes. Thank you. Presiding officer, balance for better is a call to action to address the overrepresentation of men at the expense of women on business boards and political chambers and on the media. This situation, a situation where 52% of the population are underrepresented, harms everyone. I've said it many times and I will keep saying it. It's not about, just about unfairness to the women and girls not participating, to the women and girls not visible. It's damaging to society as a whole. Diverse groups make better decisions. Diverse groups make better policy, resulting in better outcomes for our communities. The UN Special Rapporteur said of the UK welfare reform that so disproportionately reaped misery on women, and particularly single parents and disabled and the young. If you got a group of misogynists together in a room and said, how can we make a system that works for men but not for women, they wouldn't have come up with too many other ideas than what's in place. I don't know how many women were in the room when these reforms were developed, but I do know that still in 2019, in our parliaments and in our council chambers, women, in particular women from black and ethnic minority communities, particularly disabled women, are woefully underrepresented. And if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. In 2016, I was one of only 45 female MSPs elected to serve in the parliament. It's not good enough. And it's not good enough that we have no women from black ethnic minority communities in here either. Only this week I've heard at both Gillian Martin's Women in Enterprise cross-party group and on my own committee, real-life examples of the structural racism that exists here in Scotland, coupled with sexism, you can see how crucial it is that we have more black and minority ethnic women, women's voices in our institutions. At the last election, Scottish Labour and the SNP took action to ensure more female MSPs were in our parliament. Waiting for change that moves at a glacial pace is not an option. If you believe in equality, then measures have to be taken to redress the imbalance. Action has to be taken. Slogans and hashtags are not enough. And, presiding officer, there's solid evidence that when you do that, quality increases. It doesn't decrease, it increases. And to those in groups where white, middle-aged, able-bodied men are overrepresented, I'd simply ask that they reflect on this. Perhaps when they're using the word merit, it's actually privilege they're referring to. I utterly reject the notion that men are overrepresented in public life because they're better. And I reaffirm my commitment to legislation, to quotas, to action. Deeds, not words, as sister suffragettes used to say. The Scottish Government motion also talks to upholding and protecting the rights of women and girls. Briefly, very briefly. Maurice um, Corrie. Thank you. Would the member not agree that it's also very important that the, uh, you actually assess people also on their skills and suitability to jobs, irrespective of what sex they are? Uh, thank you. And it would help you speak to your microphone next oh, time. But we heard you nevertheless. <laughs> right, you. Uh, Ruth McGuire. officer, there is evidence that when you have more diverse groups of people, the quality goes up. Nobody's talking about having unqualified people. And what I'm saying to you is that this perception that the overrepresentation of men is about merit, it's not. It's about privilege. It's about the privilege of white, able-bodied men. 
upholding the rights of women and girls. They're fundamental human rights, and these rights have been long and hard fought for and should be defended vigorously. The fight is not over. We have female genital mutilation, prostitution, sexual slavery. Women and girls are refused access to education, access to political participation. Women and girls are trapped in conflicts globally where rape is used as a weapon of war. And around the world, deaths relating to pregnancy and childbirth are needlessly high, and women and girls are prevented from making deeply personal choices about their reproductive health care. As the Cabinet Secretary said in opening, women as a sex class do not have equality, and the fight is not over, not in this country and not globally. The rights of women and girls must be defended vigorously. I'm very grateful to all the organisations that the CABSEC mentioned and to the many individuals who do just that, however they describe their feminism. And I would just finish in thanking my colleague Joan McAlpine for speaking up this week and raising a matter that many of us have been uncomfortable raising. I thank all women who do that. Thank you very much. I call Alison Harris to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Ms Harris, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am also delighted to be speaking in today's debate. Tomorrow, as we've heard, marks International Women's Day, where people from all over the world celebrate the economic, cultural, social and political achievements of women. International Women's Day first officially occurred in 1911, with over one million people in support. Nowadays, it belongs to so many more. After what seemed like steady years of steady progress, it feels like the last few have been a huge step forward for social and culture, cultural change. The impact of this has been felt all over the world. Attitudes are changing at a fast pace. We've seen this in politics, in business, in cinema, sport, and right across the spectrum. One where we are witnessing progress, or one place where we're witnessing progress, is here in Scotland, and it's in the gender pay gap. This, this, is, well, this looks at the difference between the average hourly pay rates for men and women. The Office of National Statistics published gender pay gap data annually. In Scotland, the gap has been narrowing consistently. In the decade from 2008 to 2018, it almost halved down to 5.7%, and that's the second lowest of any part of the UK. There have been other areas of positive advancements in business too. In various areas, glass ceilings have been broken and talented women have won through. The most recent Women in Work Index report by PwC said that Scotland was the top performing part of the UK in terms of gender diversity in the workplace. But International Women's Day isn't just about celebrating. It's also a call to action for accelerating gender pa parity wherever we can. In 2017, the UK government made it compulsory for companies with over 250 employees to report their annual, annual gender pay gap. Last year's figures revealed that every sector in the UK paid men on average more than women, and the construction and the financial sectors reported the widest pay gaps. There is always more we can do, and more progress has to be made. Scotland still struggles in encouraging girls into science, technology, engineering, and mechanics or STEM subjects. As reported in June last year, just 9.1% of STEM modern apprenticeship starts are female. Moving forward at this rate, you know, there will be longer term problems in actually getting women into senior positions within the STEM sectors. The underrepresentation also prevents women from developing and influencing new attitudes amongst others within these sectors. Education is vital in driving towards gender balance here in Scotland and throughout the world. Each year, International Women's Day focuses on a different theme. As the motions and others have mentioned, this year's focus is on Balance for Better campaign, which will run throughout 2019, asking all members of society to drive for gender balance around the world. This campaign emphasises that everyone has a part to play, not just women and at all times. Gender balance is essential for economies, communities and societies to thrive. And gender balance is improving. In politics, we currently have our second female Prime Minister and a female First Minister. And our current and previous leader here in the Scottish Conservatives are both women. And I know the hard work of those involved in our Women to Win initiative will improve female representation in these benches in the future. There are many aspects of this issue that are improving and so many that need more attention. As we mark International Women's Day, let's welcome and celebrate the improvements but let's also recommit to call to action to bring about gender balance throughout our society 
and beyond the wider world. A balanced world is a better world. And just one final point. I read this recently, and I think it's a very appropriate for today. So you're sorry. A woman, I, you're I, a woman, so that alone makes you pretty remarkable. That, that, Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, uh, Fulton McGregor, followed by John Mason. Mr Mason will be the last speaker in the open debate. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to, um, to participate in today's debate ahead of International Women's Day. Uh, it's a day when we celebrate. Yes, uh, yeah, yes, your microphone helps if it's upright. Thanks very much. <laughs> It's a day when we celebrate women's and, and girls' achievement and their social, economic and cultural contribution to society. But it's also an opportunity to come together and continue the conversation as to how we ensure our society is more equal. We have so much work left to do and we, we still do not see gender equality across society. But with a shared commitment, this is certainly achievable. And I would encourage everybody to reassess what they can do to help make society equal, whether that is as business owners, the media, members of parliament, or for all of us as members of society. But I want to spend my time, President Officer, uh, speaking about um, my campaign on four weeks paternity leave or um, shared uh, parental leave. And I want to mention that I'm actually speaking, I'm very honoured actually to be asked to speak at an event tomorrow uh, on International Women's Day about how dads impact on gender equality. And it's, it's in Edinburgh starting at 10 o'clock and I can give any members the details who would maybe want to, to come along to that. And I also just take this opportunity before I go on to speak about that uh, to, to thank um, the work of Gillian Martin and Ivan McKee and the Shared Parenting Cross Party Group, uh, of which I've recently become the convener. And I want to thank members of that group for agreeing at the recent meeting of pursuing this area further. Um, Poseidon Officer, as you, you might be aware, just now in the United Kingdom and Scotland, fathers get up to two weeks uh, paid leave, which the, the dad can take from birth of the child. And some employers, including the Scottish Government, do offer a wee bit more up to four weeks, but the, the general standard is two weeks, with one week being paid and the other week unpaid. But this situation only reflects and reinforces cultural assumptions about traditional gender roles, where the father is the breadwinner and the mother is the primary carer. And we all have a duty, presiding officer, to challenge that he head on. Other countries are very much leading the way here. For example, in Iceland, Slovenia, Sweden, Finland and Norway offer between 10 and 12 weeks of maternity leave. And research from these countries indicates very strongly that where there is higher paternity leave, higher levels of gender equality are reported, and that's the key. Balance is better. And statistics show that fathers are doing more of the childcare than ever before, still not as much as mothers do. Uh, and I probably think the research is probably about half of what mothers do. That is clearly still not equality. Far from it, but it is progress, and there is evidence that it's, it's moving in a generational uh, manner, and that uh, people of my generation perhaps are doing more than maybe our fathers and their grandfathers and so on. But if we want true equality, we must break down the barriers that are in place. So on International Women's Day, it is good that it is no longer just assumed that it will be the mother that will do all of the childcare. And I was going to intervene in, in Annie Wales early, and it was simply to say that I've spoken out against the UK government um, shared paternity scheme in here before. Yes, it has its benefits, and I know that it works for some families, and I think its intention was sound, I, I would have to say that. But I agree with many stakeholders um, who are now speaking out about it, and even a, a recent a paper from North Lanarkshire Council that, that basically says the scheme is fundamentally flawed. That's because, in essence, it results in parents having to work out how to split the same period of leave. And many use the scheme uh, do so on financial grounds, and it sends a message, really, that any time that's taken from the mother spend attaching with her child is her responsibility. And that perpetuates the cultural assumptions that, that I've spoken about and does not take into account possible power imbalances there uh, that, that, that could exist within relationships. So there should be a, a, a separate pater, uh, paternity leave policy for fathers, and I'm, I'm working with uh, Fathers Network Scotland and others about launching a campaign specifically on this uh, and about the, the, the devolution of the power uh, to this parliament in, in that area. And it is a fact, President of that increased paternity leave benefits everyone as a society as a whole. It allows fathers to spend more valuable time with their children, lowers rates of postnatal depression for women, allows for a quicker return to work and helps us men, very importantly, helps us men to reflect and challenge implicit attitudes about mothers being the primary caregivers. And I can see that I'm running out and of time. Yes, you're um, right there. You can see it, so you can sit down. Thank you very Thank much. You. And uh, I call John Mason, then we move to closing speeches. Mr Mason, uh, four minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I do appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I think it's important that we have uh, men's voices on this topic. Uh, firstly, thinking as Vice Convener of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee, uh, I think we have been trying to 
uh, make the role of women part of our inquiries in topics we've looked at, like Scottish Enterprise, HIE, Business Gateway, and previously, as I think Gillian Martin mentioned, uh, we did a report on the gender pay gap. And while it's good that organisations are now having to publish data, the reality is we are not making as much progress in this regard as we should be. I, th I thank Engender for their briefing for today's debate, and they talk about an average pay gap of 14%, while for part-time workers it is 30%. They also point out that 63% of workers on poverty wages are women. Clearly, Scotland is not alone in having an unacceptable gender pay gap, and I think the committee was surprised when we heard that there is still quite a serious problem in Sweden, which many of us would see as one of the most progressive countries. That is not to excuse our failures here, but I think it does show that some of these problems are very deep-rooted and around the world. The Economy Committee's current inquiry is on the construction sector, which has been mentioned already, and it is very clear that women are seriously underrepresented. It, nor does it seem that much progress is being made when we look at the number coming into apprenticeships. We had nine young apprentices at committee on Tuesday, two of whom were women, but clearly peer pressure, family expectations, and perhaps even stereotypes around a word like construction eh, are meaning things are not changing very quickly. There are some glimmers of light, I accept, and some individual organizations are perhaps doing slightly better than others. Just this morning, I met TSB, and their new CEO is to be a woman, Debbie Crosby, who I think is to be the, will be the only woman heading up a major UK bank, and she was also, I believe, the first woman to sign a Scottish banknote. Another piece of positive news has been the settlement at last in the Glasgow City Council equal pay dispute. Men and women must be paid the same for work of equal value. And of course, this applies to other organizations, and ASDA is one which I believe is currently going through a dispute. But sadly, eh, this still leaves the problem of a woman in one organization being paid less than man in another organization for work of equal value. Moving on to a different topic, and gender also reminded us that 65% of MSPs are men, while 71% of councillors in Scotland are also men. I think my own party's thinking has changed in this over the years. We saw talented individuals like Nicola Sturgeon, Fiona Hislop, and Shona Robinson rise to the very top. And I think for a while we assumed that the equal numbers of women would just come through automatically. However, this has proved not to be the case, and I wholeheartedly agree that it has been right to make the Cabinet 50-50 and take other positive action to move things forward. Of course, a slight downside to this is that in the backbenches, we now have a predominance of men. C could we ensure a 50-50 split of men and women here in the Parliament? I think there are options that should be looked at, including using the list system to create a balance. Or we could go as far as saying that half constituencies should only have women candidates from all parties and the other half only men candidates and that would probably ensure 50-50. I don't know if people would want to go that far. Finally, on a different topic, last Friday, as some may know, was the World Day of Prayer, and that used to be called the Women's World Day of Prayer, but it has been widened out, and some men are now allowed to go, eh, although it is still organized by women, and this year it was organized by women from Slovenia. If I can just quote you eh, one of the women from Slovenia, she said, I am a researcher in a scientific institute. I wish, however, that the balance between family care and work would be more favorable to families and less restrictive to women in their working place. In spite of the full legal equality, women still have to bear a double burden. I think this emphasizes why it's an international day we are marking, because women all around the world have not had a good deal. And that is both disappointing, but it can be encouraging in that we are not alone in Scotland, but we are working with people around the world to improve things. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Closing speeches, I call Elaine Smith to close for Labour, please, Ms. Smith. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This has been a really positive debate with many interesting contributions from both men and women. Um, and as Anna Sarwar and John Mason said, men should be supporting women in their struggle for equality. And whilst I know what Maurice Corrie said, our male colleagues' uh, solidarity is very welcome. In closing for Labour, I join with other members in celebrating women's achievements and I welcome the Scottish Parliament's commitment to making progress on women's representation at every level of public life. We rightly celebrate women who inspire each other, their families and their communities. And Annie Wells mentioned a great many examples of women doing that. Um, and I too, like Annie, uh, want to wish a happy International Women's Day to my mum Moira, who's been inspirational to me as a school teacher, a champion swimmer, a mum and a grandmother. So I take the opportunity to do that. 
However, of course, it's not enough to simply celebrate or increase women's representation. The voices of women need to be heard and acted on. And that was a point made strongly by Rhoda Grant and also by Angela Constance and Ruth Maguire in the debate. We know that that will result in better policy, stronger laws and a more equal society. President Officer, recently in women's health, women themselves are tackling inequalities, whether that's mesh survivors, who we heard of earlier uh, this week, thyroid patients or endometriosis sufferers, and they are making parliamentarians and governments listen to them and support them. Cross-party groups are also taking up issues affecting women, and that was a point made by Gillian Martin yesterday at the Cross-party Group and Women's Enterprise, which she chairs. Fiona Matovo of a company called Radiant and Brighter who support migrant communities and their specific needs addressed the meeting and Gillian Martin pointed out that Fiona is in the gallery. Fiona spoke about challenges faced in finding work and setting up business after experiencing years of unemployment as a result of immigration controls and gaps in employment support provision and she emphasised how important it is to listen to these communities and work with them in developing the most appropriate services needed which in the main are actually not there. Several members also mentioned the fact that BME women are more likely to be out of work on lower wages or in households living in poverty. And we need to acknowledge that and take responsibility as a parliament for changing it. Also, for women living with disabilities, as mentioned by other members, the statistics tell a tale of greater discrimination, pressure and stress at work, higher unemployment and, and few opportunities to maximise their potential. Only last year, the HRC Scotland report is Scotland Fairer concluded that women and disabled people were more likely to experience severe material deprivation. The speakers from the MS Society at yesterday's CPG on Women's Enterprise reminded us that we are not getting it right yet, whether that be employers, business support services or governments. Too many women with disabilities are out of work or they're struggling to get by and debilitating health conditions such as MS, thyroid, mesh complications and endometriosis predominantly affect women. As mentioned by Shirley-Anne Somerville and Annie Wells, last year marked the centenary of some women in this country getting the vote. Of course, since then, there's been significant progress made in women's representation in the chamber itself, among staff who work in the parliament and the members of the public who come in to engage. This is a parliament we shouldn't forget with a crest facility, in fact, the only one of its kind I understand in the world, to facilitate engagement. And it's a parliament that legislates on violence against women, on childcare and on breastfeeding. And we should be proud of the differences made to women's lives. But we also need to recognise, as did those women campaigning for the vote, that we still have work to do. And I very much agree with the point that Ruth Maguire made about male privilege in that regard. With rising numbers of children living in poverty, many of those growing up in households with at least one adult in work and disproportionately high poverty levels amongst households headed by women, increasing, uh, still, uh, sorry, increasing still more amongst the BME population and women with disabilities, I'm pleased that the government has in opening used this International Women's Day debate to renew a commitment to take more action. So in closing, presiding officer, I would like to remind members that International Women's Day has its origins, as Andrew Whiteman actually did, in the Labour and Trade Union movement, origins which recognise the strength of collective voice and collective action. Collectively, I think that we can do better for women in many of the areas mentioned in this debate, health, poverty, enterprise, for BME women and for women with disabilities. And for the very last word, I'd like to go back to Fiona speaking at the CPG on women in enterprise yesterday. She said, in Africa, we have a saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Scottish Labour will support the motion tonight. Thank you very much. And I call on Rachel Hamilton to close for the Conservatives. Ms Hamilton, seven minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Planning Officer. Uh, in closing for the Scottish Conservatives today, I want to wish everyone a happy International Women's Day and take this opportunity to reflect on the excellent contributions from across the chamber. The simplicity of the strap line that we've heard today, balance for better, has been touched on, and it really does encompass the value of female contribution and representation in this place, in media and work place, in life and in society. And although the stark statistics that the minister uh, set out really did reveal the true inequality that women face, but we have heard today that a good balance benefits our economy 
and enriches and enhances every aspect of a society. And that's what we must focus on, even though the picture of global inequality is fairly depressing. I want to um, actually pay tribute to a, a group of people uh, that, uh, from the borders called CEDA, and CEDA stands for Children Experiencing Domestic Abuse and Recovery, and they run a therapeutic educational program for uh, children, young people and mothers. And this group picked up an award last year. Um, it's a Violence Against Women Award last year. And I congratulate them on their incredibly uh, powerful work. Um, on these bench benches, we are very proud uh, to have launched Women to Win in Scotland, which mentors and, and nurtures and supports women into politics. And last year, we also announced a diversity commission led by Nishina Mubarak to increase the number of females in BME candidates selected and elected. Most people in this uh, chamber realise that we don't support mandatory quotas, but to be honest, they are a pl pretty blunt instrument, and we have had that debate before. But we do, want, we do believe in recognising that many women count themselves out before they even get to selection or recruitment process. Um, we need to address these obstacles, not put a sticking plaster on them, of course. Ruth McGuire. I just I, I recognise that there's probably uh, there will be valuable work that you're doing in encouraging and, and, and cajoling and mentoring, but if that doesn't work, will you take additional action? How long are you prepared to wait to have equal representation on your benches? Rachel Hamilton. Well, I thank Ruth Maguire for that intervention. Obviously, working up to 2021, we want to see more women um, selected and elected, and that will probably be our benchmark. But I'm um, looking towards education, which um, many have agreed today that uh, women and girls can realise their potential and aim for the top, which is so vitally important um, to ensure that we do have a balance in the workplace, uh, which Ruth Maguire has, has also just highlighted across society. And many members have spoken out about STEM subjects today. Um, no subject, whether physics, computing studies or chemical engineering, must be out of bounds for girls at school. STEM subjects are the key to how our future economy and girls at school should be encouraged to participate in these sub subjects without hesitation. Nevertheless, we know that this is not the case pres presently. Yes? Cabinet Secretary. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. I, I would hope that um, given the the number of times that this has been referenced by the Conservatives, that they would welcome the STEM strategy, which I launched as Higher and Further Education uh, Minister uh, with a special responsibility for STEM, specifically to, to, to tackle those, because I absolutely recognise uh, the points that Rachel Hamilton is making. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Minister for that intervention, and I, I congratulate and support the, the work in STEM by the, by the Scottish Government. Um, we have to look at the statistics, though, and um, the minister knows that the percentage of women studying a STEM degree only makes up 24% of the uh, total. And in computer science, the growth in the number of female graduates was far behind the growth in the number of male graduates, 3.1% uh, uh, versus 9% respectively. And Annie Wells highlighted a really stark statistic that just 15.1% of engineering undergraduates in the UK were women compared to 30% in India. And perhaps there are international models that we should be looking at too. Uh, empowering women and girls through education is certainly one way in which we could help improve this statistic through greater female participation. Well, go on then. Very grateful. Yep, just a minute, I have to call you. I have a little job. Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. It's just to say that uh, the, the, the graduate numbers are not the only thing we should be looking at. We should be looking at how, how many women stay in engineering, because there is a leakage of women coming out of engineering as well. And I think that's just as important. I thank and before Gillian. you speak, I don't need oh. uh, your assistance, Mr. Rumbles. Step too far. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. I, I thank uh, Gillian Martin for that uh, really relevant point because um, that is absolutely what we should be doing. We should look at, be looking at women returner to work um, programmes. And indeed, if a woman has trained as a graduate in engineering, um, very often uh, home life or caring for somebody else actually takes over. And there isn't a way to get back into that. So we must be nurturing and getting those uh, women back into those roles. Um, Rhoda Grant actually uh, mentioned that uh, the types of jobs males and females do, and um, I wanted to highlight a stat that I, I found from British Gas, which showed that 70% of girls um, 
were most, they thought that they were most suited to careers in beauty, childminding, nursing or education. And whilst these careers are certainly rewarding, and indeed we need carers, we need people working in social care and nursing, um, but it highlighted that putting more women in what ordinarily would be a male choice of apprenticeship could actually uh, bridge that gender pay gap. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton spoke um, about uh, work practice in the workplace, and we have to get it right for women in the workplace. Um, Gillian Martin spoke of the gender pay gap, and it's still at 17.9%, which is too high. But we know that the Scottish Government are, are looking at this, and the UK Government are working to narrow that gap. And the Government Equalities Office has published a What Works guidance for employers to improve the recruitment and progression of women and help close that gender pay gap. In my own constituency, I'm hoping that the South of Scotland Economic Partnership um, Agency, which will be set up uh, next spring, um, will address some of the issues that we do have with the gender pay gap. Um, presiding officer, I think I've taken too many interventions because I've got so much to say, um, but uh, I wanted to go into... No time to say it, I'm uh, afraid. Well, OK. Uh, and I just want to make one little point there about childcare. Yesterday, we highlighted some of the flaws in the expansion of the childcare provision. Um, flexibility is absolutely key to allow women to return to work after having children, and parents should have the ability to choose a setting that suits their children. And I'll sit down there because you're giving me the look. Thank you, <laughs> presiding officer. <laughs> I don't know what you're referring to, Ms Hamilton. And I call on Christina McKelvey to close the Scottish Government till decision time, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, uh, can I thank everyone for their contributions across the Chamber this afternoon and I wish you all a happy International Women's Day. I am incredibly pleased to be closing uh, today's International Women's Day debate for the Government in my role as Minister for Older People and Equalities. As many people in this Chamber will know from my 11 plus years as an MSP, I have been an advocate for uh, all of these uh, equality issues and some would maybe say an outspoken one and maybe just spoken in just about every single International Women's Day debate we've had in this Parliament and very proud to do so. This has, been, has meant that International Women's Day has held a very significant um, special place for me. In years gone by, it used to be one of the few opportunities to find space to discuss women's equality and to raise awareness of syst systemic change required to achieve women's rightful place in society. And we had many, many examples of how we can do that and many, many ex examples of the work we still have on hand. However, I see a Scotland now where women and girls and men and boys are making space to discuss these issues on a daily basis in schools and colleges, workplaces, their homes, and of course, on social media. The debate on women's equality can no longer be contained to just one or even 16 days. It's now a debate for everyone, every day. And our debate this afternoon has been very far ranging, the breadth and depth of all of the topics, but I want to pick up some of the points. It was really great to hear Angela Constance talking about Mary Beard, because Mary Beard reminded us through the lovely accent of Miss Constance that women's place has been undermined throughout the entire of history and how we should campaign for the freedom of others. I loved meeting Mary Beard when I went along to the Dublin, uh, the Women's Caucus in Dublin recently and met, met with some of the amazing feminist uh, activists from Ireland who have been in the news recently. And Rachel Hamilton touched on um, and highlighted on the work of local groups to minimise domestic viol violence and she will know that the Scottish Government is committed to tackling domestic abuse through enactment of the new domestic abuse offence and working with justice partners to ensure readiness for its implementation. The Act will come into effect on the 1st of April 2019 and will send a clear message that domestic abuse will not be tolerated and can be dealt with under our law. It's vital that we take these necessary measures to ensure that the justice system is ready, prepared and equipped to deal with cases involving coercive control and behaviour. And the Scottish Government has provided funding to Police Scotland to support the development of training for 14,000 police officers and staff. And just last week, presiding officer, at CEDAW, the oral examination of the UK by the UN CEDAW committee was just the 26th of February. The Scottish Government were represented in Geneva as part of the UK delegation. And gender attended alongside with the UK NGOs and the committee will publish its report soon and I'm sure we'll be all happy to hear what they've got to say about Scotland. Elaine Smith raised a very important issue about health inequality when it comes to women and who would have known how successful the period poverty campaign had it not been for women working together in this place. But the other side of that is the menopause campaign that she will know I'm involved in and I am determined that the government improves its position for women affected by the menopause. 
We funded the Scottish Women's Convention to hold a conference on menopause last month and heard directly from women about their experiences and what action they wanted this government to take. I heard from many, many women that want more clinical research on menopause, workplace policies to support women rather than discipline for struggling with their symptoms, increased awareness raising and a consistent health response across the country. I'm sure we all want that. But can I just touch on some of the points that many people raised in the chamber today because there were so many. Annie Wells, Alison Harris and Rachel Hamilton all raised the issue about apprenticeships and they may have seen that we've committed to 30,000 apprenticeships by 2020. The commitments in the STEM strategy and I would hope that they would be looking out very soon for some uh, up-to-date progress on the STEM trap strategy and at this point can I just welcome the amazing work of Equate Scotland and what they do to ensure that we fix that leaky pipe and keep those women in those jobs. Rhoda Grant raised the issue about respect and consent, something that we have debated a lot over the past year in this chamber, especially in schools. Equally safe, the whole schools approach, working with our causal partners to roll out this and tackle the issues that both boys and girls face in school environments, I would hope would go some way to tackle some of that. And Andy Whiteman, and Anas Sarwar, and Fulton McGregor all talked about men's as allies. With the, uh, Anna Sarwa described as me, real men are feminists and I agree with them and the responsibilities of fathers but a very very interesting point that he brought up that is absolutely key to everything we do is the issue about intersectionality so whether it's your race your gender your disability whether you're facing as a woman you're a victim of racism Islamophobia and anti-semitism we've still got a job of work to do in ensuring we tackle that. Alex Cole uh, Hamilton reflected on the point of the need for better gender balance in political parties, the global society and how we treat women differently, the pink tax, universal credit, and I'm sure he'll welcome our campaign on split payments for that. Gillian Martin, Alison Harris and John Mason all raised the gender pay gap and, and the work that we need to do on that, especially the work we need to do on equal pay. And I'm sure that they would all welcome the gender pay gap action plan, which will be published very soon too. I was absolutely delighted to hear Maurice Corey make a commitment to gender quotas, even although I think it shocked his front bench. But I'm sure women 50-50 are looking for a Conservative member of their group, and I'm sure they would welcome Maurice, should he want to do that. <laughs> Maurice Corey, I'm not sure your microphone's on, Mr Corey, is it? Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, I'd like to just correct that slightly, uh, that I also, I also, what I meant to say, probably to caveat it, was that it's also, it, we very much believe in based on skill and what that job or position requires. And of course we encourage as many people, to, uh, many women as forward to come forward. After all, I'm a father of three daughters, so I have no option but to say that. <laughs> Christina McKelvey. Oh, Maurice Corrie's just wiped a smile off my face because I thought we'd made real progress with the Conservatives this afternoon. So I'm looking forward to maybe continuing to change his mind. Um, Presiding Officer Ruth Maguire reminded us of the words of Philip Alston and the rape clause and how that was written by uh, misogynists. And like Anas Sawar, called for better balance and representation in this place, which includes women from all of our diverse groups. Elaine Smith called for this as well. Increasing women's representation across the board is a key element to the work that we need to to do. Presiding officer, I'm sure that um, my ministerial colleagues across the chamber, or women across the chamber, or male allies across the chamber, will be really keen to keep working on how we take forward the issue of women's equality in all of the areas that we do. Because as we know, we do that progress, we do that work very, very locally. So we all have a responsibility as local MSPs to take forward all of the issues that create that inequality. Presiding officer, last year I took part in this debate from the back benches, and this year, along with Cabinet Secretary, I'm incredibly proud to be leading the government's work in tack tackling gender inequality. And as was referenced earlier, this includes overseeing our response to the recommendations made by the First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls. We have come such a long, long way along the path. I thought we'd taken the Conservatives along a bit further in that path today on gender equality, but I really look forward to taking that next step on Scotland's journey to equality. Thank you very much, Minister, and that concludes our debate on International Women's Day 2019. Now, before we come to decision time, we have a committee announcement, and I'm pleased to call Jenny Mara, Convener of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee, to make an announcement on 
post legislative scrutiny of the Freedom of Information Scotland Act. Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, thank you for allowing me to make a committee announcement in my capacity as convener of that committee. Members may recall that in June 2017, this chamber agreed a motion stating that post legislative scrutiny of the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002 should be undertaken. I want to bring to members' attention that our committee will now be taking forward this important piece of work and that a consultation inviting written views to inform our scrutiny of the Act was launched last Friday. As members know, the Act provides the public with the right of access to information held by public bodies and it has proven to be a valuable tool in that respect. However, given that the bill for the Act was passed in 2002, the committee wishes to examine in detail whether there are any issues with how freedom of information works in practice, and if so, how such issues should be best addressed. We also intend to consider whether the Act can be improved or modernised to increase transparency in Scotland's public services. It is expected that our committee will report its conclusions towards the end of this year. The committee is keen to hear a wide range of views on the Act and I know that many members here have, will have experience of using this legislation. So we'd be keen to hear about your own experiences, both positive and negative. We'd also be grateful if members could bring the inquiry to the attention of their constituents or other contacts who may wish to help form the inquiry. I will circulate further information about the call for evidence to members shortly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And we turn now to decision time. The first question this evening is that motion 16170 in the name of Kate Forbes on Local Government Finance Scotland Order 2019 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 16170 in the name of Kate Forbes is yes 58, no 21. There were 27 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And our final question this evening is that motion 16171 in the name of Christina McKelvey on International Women's Day 2019, balance for better, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>